morning we're picking back up in 2 Corinthians and we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 5 through 12 and talking about what is held in earthen vessels. Now previously we were of course talking about the fact that we are not cowardly as Paul is expressing this. He wasn't cowardly. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 through 2 he talks about this. You know, we have a new ministry, a ministry of, under a new covenant, and he is presenting that to them. And he wasn't cowardly in relation to speaking out against the hidden things of shame. Now, of course, we're not interested in judging people, but we're going to call things what they are. And he also did not come in a way where he was speaking things that were false, but rather speaking the truth and not baiting the word of God. He wasn't trying to to put the word of God in such a way where he could bait people with it and entice them and then grab them after that. Now he was being very honest and very truthful about what he was doing. Then we also looked at the fact that the God of this age blinds the minds of those who are perishing. And yeah, sad as it is, there are some people today who just simply will not ever accept the gospel for salvation. They are actually perishing. And the God of this age intentionally blinds their mind. And in looking at that, of course, that is Satan that it's referring to there. He's specifically blinding them so that they cannot receive the light of the, of the gospel. Now, of course, it's only hidden to those who are perishing. You know, Satan doesn't want the message to get in. He doesn't want them to actually see what's going on. Because if they do, especially with the message today, it's going to impact them in a way where Satan can't influence them anymore. And he doesn't want that. So now picking back up in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 5, we're talking about God is the one who causes light to illuminate in darkness. The heralding with authority is what Paul's going to start out with. So he's heralding with authority here in verse 5. He says, for we do not proclaim ourselves... And of course, that proclaiming is to herald with authority. We're not coming proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ, Lord. And we would typically put your concept of is. So Jesus Christ is Lord. And ourselves, your servants, on account of Jesus Christ. So as Paul is presenting himself here, he's not coming and presenting himself as one who is special to them as a person who has all of the truth or anything along those lines. He's not focusing on himself. He's actually really, you know, he's not the one that brings light. And he understands that. He's bringing the truth of the gospel, but the reality is it's God who ultimately causes the light to shine in the darkness. It's not Paul. He's bringing the message. And he's not focusing on himself. He's focusing on Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 6, it clearly states that God is the one who brings light. Because the God, the one who said, out of darkness, light will illuminate. Who illuminated in our hearts, facing the light of the knowledge of a proper opinion of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This, of course, is through the gospel for salvation. You know, this is the information that is being shared and how God today is actually illuminating in the darkness first corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4 talk about the gospel now i make known to you brethren the gospel which i preached to you and really that word preached means i gospelized to you and i brought it the good news to you which also you received in which also you stand by which also you are saved this is the message by which we're saved since you hold fast the word which i preached to you Unless, of course, you believe in vain. That is, you can't just say, I'm a Christian because I'm an American. You can't say, I'm a Christian because my family is a Christian or because I go to church. No, you have to actually believe the facts of the gospel. For I delivered you, first of all, or of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. Scripture talks about Christ dying for our sins. And Christ did die for our sins. He paid that debt. And then he was buried. Of course, that proves that he actually did die. There are some who want to say that he just swooned or passed out on the cross. And, and, and that's just, you don't bury a, a, somebody who's alive. 
I mean, hey, he was buried and sealed in a tomb. And then he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Yeah, now that we have revelation, we go back to the Old Testament, we suddenly realize, okay, he was saying one good instance is, I will not allow my holy one to decay. Well, you understand what's going on in the circumstances in, in the conditions at that point. Lazarus is a good example of that. On the fourth day, body starts to rot, starts to stink. So it had to have been before the fourth day. Otherwise, that wouldn't have come true. But we didn't understand that until this happened. The same thing with the, with the disciples. They didn't really understand it until it happened. And then they go back and, they, and they're reminded of what Jesus was saying. It's like, oh, duh. <laughs> Israel, but they didn't see it. They couldn't know. But now, actually, it has been revealed to us. This is the message. This is not a message that's oftentimes taught in mainstream Christianity because Satan doesn't want this message taught. There is importance to the truth, to seeing things as they really are. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He didn't die for you. He died for our sins according to the scripture. Now, I can, I can say after I have believed, yeah, Christ did die for me. That death is attributed to me. God actually reckons that to me, but he also reckons the life to me that Christ now has. So I'm not a dead one. I'm alive unto God. Christ was raised from the dead three days later, according to the scriptures. He's not in the grave now. So we see that God is the one who's illuminating the heart of the hearts of men to truth. The heart within, and that's in our center. That's a, where our our emotions, where our rational part is, where all three parts of us, that would be the whole, the, the soul, the spirit, and the body, and the person actually resides. The very heart of us is where he actually impacts us. God is the one who said, let there be light. Nobody else said this. God is the one who said it. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Okay, so God said, let there be light back in Genesis. What is he talking about? Understand what's going back on in Genesis. Really important to actually understand. There's a little bit more detail than at first you pick up because oftentimes it's focused that this is the creation of the universe. And Genesis chapter one, verse one, absolutely is. Creation of the universe. But then something happens. Something changes and darkness settles upon the earth. The earth was in a state of judgment, and there was no light upon the deep. It does not say there was no light in the universe. It says there was no light upon the deep. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. The earth was formless and void. Now, the formless and void really, I mean, that, the way that that's expressed, it kind of gives us a not a really good picture in our mind because we're kind of thinking, well, the earth was just this big blob hanging out in space and hadn't been put together yet. But that's, a, that's not what these words indicate. These words indicate that we have an earth, but it's completely barren. It's in, it's in total ruin right now. And if it's in total ruin, that would have meant that it had to have prior to that been in order. Otherwise, it could not be in this state of formless and void. The words that it's actually using there may, really do mean you had to have that order prior to it. And darkness was over the, the surface of the deep. Now, the surface of the deep, of course, is deep down in the waters. And the Spirit of God was moving over the uh, surface of the waters. There's a lot more in there too we could talk about because you know a lot of people just they they glance over this but there's so much information that's being revealed in here you know the spirit is actually brooding over the waters that brooding is protecting and that brooding actually shows that the spirit has to be an intelligent being because only an intelligent being or a rat or you know in this case it's actually uh, a being, I should say, because it uses it of a, uh, an eagle brooding over her young. So there has to be some understanding there in order to actually do it. 
the way it translates is like the earth move or the spirit moving over the surface of the water. Some translate it as spirit instead of uh, spirit, they translate it as wind. But you can't do that because of the word, what the word moving means. It's brooding. Lucifer has fallen. That's what happened. So prior to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, something happened. Isaiah chapter uh, 14, verses 13 and 14 talk about this. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recess of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. He said in his heart, I will ascend to the heaven, which means he's not in the heaven. Where is he? He's actually on earth. He's on Eden. He's in Eden, which is earth. Okay. This is where his throne is at. Because he's going to put his throne up where God's throne is in the third heaven, to the north. And he is going to, and of course it tells us the direction, by the way, to the north. He's going to then ascend above the, the heights of the clouds. The clouds that he's talking about are the, the Shekinah glory clouds in the third heaven. Why? Because Satan wants you to be like God. Well, actually, he still wants to be like God. So he fell. And the earth was judged as a result of his actions. Because God didn't place him up there. So he sinned. And in his actions, judgment came. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 5 talks about this. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water. And that formed word means actually was caused to stand out from water. And by water, which would be through water. We actually two, see two instances where the earth was covered in water. The first one was with Lucifer. And what happened, you know, you go on in the book of, of Genesis, you see that God caused the, the earth to rise out from the water. But then the next one, the next time the earth is actually flooded, it's actually through water. Because ultimately the... the um, the fountains of the deep are opened up and the and the ice dome that we had on the earth collapses but then the water actually completely fades away and goes back to its place the two completely different floods that happened having a proper opinion of god in jesus christ that's where this light is going it's going to manifest the truth to us you know, rejecting God actually brings darkness. We see this over in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Here it says, because they, knowing thee, God, did not as God express a proper opinion of him or were thankful, but were rendered worthless in their reasonings, and their foolish hearts were caused to be darkened. They were caused to be darkened because they rejected the truth of God. They didn't want to know God. Now, this is talking about humans, and there were, there are uh, at least, well, and specifically here, what it's talking about is right after the flood, those who knew exactly why God brought that flood, and they knew God, but they chose to not glorify him as God. What did they start to do in the context there? They started to worship the creation rather than the creator. And because of that, their minds were darkened. They couldn't see the truth. The God of this age blinds the mind of the unsaved from the gospel of salvation. He, again, he doesn't want anybody receiving this message. And there's a reason for this. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 is where it specifically talks about this. In whom the God of this age has blinded the thoughts of the unbeliever. And it is uh, this thoughts would be the, the workings of the mind of the unbeliever resulting in the uh, enlightenment of the gospel of the proper opinion of God, who is the image of the God, not shining bright to them. 
can't see it because he's blinding their, their minds, the workings of their mind. This gospel, Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. Such simple words, really, if you think about it. But they have a power that most words don't have. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 talks about this. They actually have the ability to save a person. For I myself am not ashamed of the gospel of the Christ, for it is the natural ability of God unto salvation to all the ones who believe. It's an inherent ability or natural ability of God for all those who believe to actually bring salvation. Now, what's the significance of this? It's different than other messages through history. Now, you go back to even from the very beginning when there was a promise made that the seed of, a, of the woman would actually crush Satan. Okay, that was a message that didn't, it didn't resonate in the same way that the gospel resonates today. There's also the gospel of the kingdom of the heavens. Where Christ, when he came, what was he preaching? The gospel of the kingdom of the heavens. That's what he started out with. Now, when Israel began to reject him, he started presenting the gospel of the kingdom of God, which is a different gospel, different kingdom, different focus. But the gospel of the kingdom of the heavens, we actually see it in the parable of the sower over in Matthew chapter 13, verse 2 through 8. Now, this is to Israel. The Messiah has come. Now, it wasn't, by the way, just a message that he brought by words. He actually brought actions with those words. And it wasn't just that he went around and healed people. It was his, all of his works. He called out the Pharisees for exactly the heresy that they were doing. But he also lived a life that showed who God the Father actually is. Fully living a life glorifying God. So he's speaking to Israel concerning the gospel of the kingdom. He's not speaking to anybody else. Matthew chapter 13, really important to keep it in context. Remember, in Matthew here, we are still in the Old Testament. Jesus came during the Old Testament. This is not New Testament. The church hasn't even been mentioned at this point. So you can't bring the church into this because he's not addressing the church. He's not even, he hasn't even revealed anything about the church at this point. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11, and Jesus answered them. To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens, but to them it has not been granted. Now, of course, he's talking to the disciples who were what? Jews. And to the them, the Jews he just spoke with. He's talking to Jews in the context. Keep it in context. The evil one could snatch the message out of their mind. Ooh. That's right. The gospel could come in. The message of the kingdom could come in. And the evil one could snatch it from them. Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. And anyone who hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one whose seed has been sown beside the road. Now, Israel should have understood the message. They had more than enough evidence of this. Now, remember, when it comes to Israel and what God said to Israel and the information he gave them, he gave them a very specific timeline. So specific, Israel should have been standing there on the day that God said that the Messiah would enter into Jerusalem because he did on that day. They had it. They should have had it on their calendar, marked. This is the day. Because they had the information. Now, for us of the church, we don't have a timeline. We don't have that. We're waiting for the rapture. The rapture could happen today, tomorrow. I don't know. I'd say in 100 years, but I highly doubt it. Getting to the point where I'm really surprised we're all here today because we're not, you know, Christ hasn't come. And what I mean by that is, we are getting so close to the end. It's, it's just so close. And one of these days, we're really going to step into eternity. The message of the kingdom of the heavens could be snatched away from somebody who didn't, didn't understand what they were actually, the message that they had. 
but the gospel, the message that we give today, can't be snatched once it enters the heart. Once it enters the heart, it has the ability to save a person. Light brings a proper understanding of God through Jesus Christ. Now, that proper understanding that comes from your word glory, and glory does mean to have or hold a proper opinion. And that's what it's actually expressing. Remember, too, as a result of this, when it comes to this being a luminary, because it does actually use the word luminary. It doesn't use the word like bright light. It uses more like a smaller luminary type of a light. Some will translate it as a lamp. Although, you know, I guess you kind of get the idea. It's not like all of a sudden this person sees this really bright light and they just understand everything. It's a little luminary light. You know, and it's the same thing that we, through our lives, can actually manifest. Well, really, actually, let me get that correct. God, through us, can actually show a light to those around us. Because it really does come from God. It's not that we are producing light. It comes from God. But when we live out who we are in Christ, we're a luminary to those around us, a light to those around us. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. All of you do all things apart from grumbling and disputing in order that you yourselves should become blameless and innocent, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine as luminaries in the world. Sometimes we don't shine very brightly, but we certainly should be shining. While holding fast the word of life. Unto my boasting unto a day of Christ, that I have not run in emptiness, nor toiled unto emptiness. God's the one who actually causes this light to enter into a person. We're the ones who need to present the gospel, and not just the gospel through words, but also through our actions, because we can be luminaries to those around us. And we have this in earthen vessels. You know, salvation is interesting when you understand what God has done with us in the church. There, we have a very unique salvation. We actually have a saved spirit. But we have two other parts to us. We have a, a, a physical body and we have a soul. And those two haven't been saved yet. So we have the, the salvation that we have. We actually hold it in these clay pots, these earthen pots, which would be our flesh. And there's a reason for that. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 goes on. But we have these treasure in earthen made vessels. In, in order that the superabounding of the inherent ability should be from God and not from us. The light of the knowledge of the proper opinion of God, we actually possess this in our bodies right now. We can understand this. And that, of course, can Im impact or should impact everything we do. It is a result of the superabounding of God's inherent ability, not ours. We didn't do anything to actually earn it. Paul's not claiming to be the source of the message that brings light. That's what he's saying. It's Jesus Christ who's the source. He's the one who brings light. The power is not from the flesh. The power is from the spirit of God. The impact of the light of a proper opinion of God is through Christ entering into our hearts. It's when, when God opens up the mind so that we understand the gospel. We understand what's happening. God's the one who does that. Now we, today, our responsibility is reconciliation, present reconciliation. So what are we going to do? We're going to present the gospel. But God's the one who is really, ultimately, the one who opens the mind. Because without God, there is no light in darkness. I said, we have a saved spirit right now. And it's important to understand. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 talks about the fact that we are joined with him in our spirit. Now, the only way we can be joined to God in our spirit is if our spirit is actually saved, because God's not, you know, first John talks about this, there's no darkness in God. He's not going to join himself with darkness. That literally means we have to be 100% saved in our spirit in order to be joined with him in that way. Our spirit is our rational part. That's where we're, that intellectual part. Because of that, we now actually have a quality of the divine nature. That is, we have access to a quality of God's nature. We are not gods. We will never be God. But we have access to a quality of his nature, which means we can manifest eternal life in these clay pots. Through this, this flesh that's plagued by the sin nature and, and all the impact that the sin nature has, we can still glorify God. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. For by these, and this is the promises that God has given to us, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them we may become partakers of, and it's really a quality of the divine nature. I know some of our translations will add the word the in there, but it's not in the original. It's a quality of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Your word lust just means desires, strong desires. We escaped it by, because we actually have a quality of the divine nature. We can actually understand the things of the spirit. You know that previously, prior to... Christ's resurrection and the church being created. No human had a saved spirit. Under the Old Testament, you didn't have a saved spirit, you didn't have a saved soul, and you didn't have a saved body. Now, they did have a promise. God guaranteed them that they would get eternal life, so they still were saved. But they didn't have the ability to live out eternal life because they didn't possess it yet. We now actually possess it. This means we can actually understand the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. But a soulish man, I know some of our translations say natural, but understand what your word natural actually means. It means soulish. And when you go back and you understand the distinctions of our different parts, our soul is our emotional part. So if you're one who's centered on functioning according to your emotions, the things of God aren't going to make sense to you because they don't always feel good. They're not always pleasing to our emotions. But a soulish man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot inherently understand them because they're spiritually discerned. They're not discerned through emotions. They're discerned through our spirit, our rational part. But he who is spiritual appraises, appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. Can't look at a person and say you're spiritual. How do I know if a person's spiritual? They got to do something. And they begin to manifest eternal life, and I can see it. For we, for who knows the mind of the Lord? The one knit together with him, that is us. And we have a quality of the mind of Christ. We can understand spiritual things. We still have a sin nature, which means we can still sin. But our sin nature has actually been rendered ineffective in Christ. I mean, think about that. You still have a sin nature, but we have the power to overcome the sin in nature that desire in us to do the things that are wrong we actually now have the power to overcome it so this is in christ this isn't in our own strength if it's by our own strength what do we do we put law on it do not do not do not and that never ends up exactly the way we wanted it to we always fail but we actually have freedom because we're in christ Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 says, experientially knowing this, that the old man has been crucified or co-crucified in order that the body of the sin, and in the context, it's talking about the sin nature. The body of the sin nature should be rendered ineffective 
It doesn't say it's destroyed. It says it can't work out what it wants. It's going to try, but it just can't work it out when we're manifesting who we are in Christ. It doesn't work. It's kind of like walking into a dark room and flicking and turning on a light. What happens to darkness? It, it can't be in the same area. It doesn't function correctly. So that we no longer are slaves to the sin nature. We actually now have the ability to mature in Christ in these earthen-made vessels. We don't have our heavenly vessels yet. We got the earthly ones right now, but we still have the ability to live out the salvation that God gives us. We actually, again, have the ability to mature. Could you mature under law? Absolutely not. You couldn't even understand spiritual things under law. You did what the law told you to do. But in Christ, we can actually mature, which means we can look at a situation and we can properly discern whether it's God's will for us to be involved in it or not. If it's a proper thing for us to do, or if it's not appropriate for us to do it. Now, under law, you had to go to the law and say, well, what does the law say? We don't need the law. We can grow. We can mature. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14 talks about this. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. And your word good and evil, good would be that which is proper and evil is that which is lacking in character. And this training is going to the gym. You got to train your senses. You know, a good way by in, in understanding this, a really good thing to start with, and there, there's a lot of areas technically you can start with, but one of the areas I find that really helps to kind of hone my thinking is just understanding and weighing the situation as to, is this God's will for me? And how do I do that? Well, I start out with what God has already revealed about his will. There's what... Uh, 12 different specific things God has revealed about his desires will for me as a Christian. Now, I know that if, if what I'm about to do is going to violate any one of those, it's not God's will for me. And how do I know that? Because God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't change the rules. Okay? When he says, this is my desires will for you, that's his, his desires will, and that's all there is to it. And I can start living these things out and understanding and weighing the situation. He then goes on to talk about manifesting the death of Christ so that others will have life. This is in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. He starts out with being pressed, that is, in tribulation. He's actually in tribulation here in verse 8. And he says, in all while being pressed, but not being restrained, while despairing, but not totally despairing. So in these earthen vessels, we have this. While being pressed, that's that word pressed is in tribulation, but not restrained. Not in a point to where we can't do anything. This word restrained, by the way, is actually used a little bit later of the Corinthian saints who were, who were restraining themselves because of their feelings. They weren't doing what they should have been doing, and they were actually doing this because of their own feelings. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12 talks about this. You are not restrained by us, but you are restrained in your own affections. You're the ones that are restraining yourself. We're not restraining you. So persecuted, but we're not to the point to where we can't do anything. We're not restrained. Despairing now, despairing would be without resources. It's kind of the focus there. But, and it is typically actually oftentimes translated as one who doesn't understand. Now, being without resources is, is the, the primary focus of it. So if you're not understanding, it means you don't have enough information to understand what, what is going on. You're lacking in the resources of, to understand this. Herod, um, Herod concerning what to do with John the Baptist. You know, Herod, he's like, I want to put him to death, but everybody knows he's actually a prophet. And if I do that, that's not going to work out very well. This is over in Mark chapter 6 and verse 20. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard 
him, he was very perplexed. Now that word perplexed is he didn't have the resources to understand what he was talking about. But he used to enjoy listening to him. So he's talking to John the Baptist. But he's like, I don't really understand what he's saying, but I know he's a holy and righteous man. He's missing some things. The two women at the grave of Christ on Sunday morning. Now you can understand why they didn't understand. They didn't have the resources to understand, wait a minute, he's been raised. They should have, but it wasn't there yet until he opened their eyes to it. Luke chapter 24 and verse 4. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. Now your word perplexed there is your same word here, which means not having sufficient resources or in other and is a trans as it's translated back there despairing they were despairing the disciples when christ stated that one of them would betray him they did you know don't go back and and again attribute to what was going on in the upper room and the things that related to that to after the resurrection because before that they didn't understand it they really didn't get the fact that christ was going to die they didn't understand that i mean peter when christ revealed it to him peter's like no 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 that's not supposed to happen <laughs> he didn't understand it and even when jesus rebuked him peter still didn't understand it like that's not what the old testament says even though technically it actually did, but they didn't understand it. Jesus talks to them about the one who's going to betray him, John chapter 13. Verse 30, uh, 21 says, And Jesus had said to, to this, When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in his spirit and testified and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, to you that one of you will betray me. And they didn't understand that trouble in their spirit. They didn't understand. Paul concerning the willingness of the Galatian Christians to reject grace. Despairing? He's like, man, I don't even have the resources in my mind to understand what you fools are doing. Why would you reject grace and go back under the law? That doesn't even make any sense. Especially with what Paul revealed to them about that. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 20. But I could wish to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Now, I don't have any resources to understand what y'all are doing. You know, it, it is sad to see Christians try to go under some quality of law. We don't live by law. We don't need law. But yet it's so predominant in teaching today. They want to say, well, you got to live by the Ten Commandments but nobody lives by the Ten Commandments. They want to say you have to love everybody, but nobody loves everybody. It's just saying, it's just words. But yet Christ specifically told us as Christians to do what? Love one another, love other Christians as he loved us. That's the doing part. And when we're doing that, we're not going to violate any quality of law. We don't need law. Despairing without resources, but not completely without resources. God did some pretty amazing things with, with Paul. Remember that. He's already kind of talked about that. You know, in situations where he's like, I'm going to die. I mean, he's looking, I, I'm going to die. And God says, no, here's an opening. It's like, I don't even know where that opening came from. Because God was still taking care of the situation having no means by which you can see a way through, but yet God is the one who opens that up. Now, this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, where he uses this word despairing of his life. For we do not desire for you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning our tribulations, the one having come to us in Asia, that just as we were exceedingly burdened beyond our natural ability, so that we despaired also to live. That is, we didn't even know how we were going to keep on living. There was no information there to, to figure it out. Yeah, when the Jews said they wanted to kill Paul, they really meant they wanted to kill Paul. And they went after him. Persecuted, but were not abandoned. 
Yeah, we get persecuted for speaking the truth, but we're not abandoned. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. While being persecuted, but not being left behind. While being struck down, but not destroyed. Men abandoned Paul, but God never did. There were times where men should have stood up with Paul, especially in his first trial in Rome. There should have been a lot of men standing up and saying, hey, he hasn't done anything worthy of death. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 6, he talks about this. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. That, that is a really sad statement when you really understand that. Nobody defended Paul. But God doesn't abandon his own. So yeah, even when men fail us, God does not abandon us. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 is one of the areas that talks about this, where he says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being um, content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. I'm not going to leave you behind. And our, our mind should be focused on that cast down but we're not ruined this word cast down uh, it actually means like to lay a foundation so it's like you're throwing somebody down to the very bottom would be the idea hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 talks about this as a foundation therefore leaving the elementary teachings about the christ let us press on to maturity not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works now going back to that foundation because you know We've already repented. We need to go on. We need to mature. We oftentimes as Christians might be cast down. We will be cast down because we're speaking the truth. But that doesn't mean we're out. Destroyed means to bring something to ruin. So even though they want to cast us down, that doesn't mean they're going to ruin us. Those who are willing to give up all to, the, to follow the Messiah, this word ruin, Mark chapter 8, verse 34, 35. For whosoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whosoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. Don't, don't misapply this passage. Take it in context. He's not talking to you as a Christian. He's talking to those who are following him when he was presenting the, the gospel of the kingdom. And if they followed him, it would bring ruin. Because, and that's what it's talking about, losing. That word losing is actually to bring to ruin. Because their, their family members would have rejected them. Their people would have rejected them because they were following Christ. Old wide skins. What happens if you put in new wine into old wide skins? They get ruined. <laughs> it doesn't work. It's kind of that. It's that word that's being expressed. Luke chapter 5 and verse 37. <clears throat> and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. They'll be of no value anymore. Because we're carrying around the death of Christ in our bodies, as you see back over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 10, as he's talking about this always while carrying around the death of our Lord Jesus Christ in the, in the body, in order that also the life of Jesus in our body should be manifested. So he's going through all of these troubles that they're having, but the reality is that even though we're persecuted, even though we're pushed down, even though we don't have resources, we're not, you know, we don't, in this situation, we don't understand how it's going to work out. God still works it out. And all the time carrying around the death of our Lord Jesus Christ in the body in order that also the life of Jesus in our body should be manifested. Christ died for our sins once for all. But one time act, he died. We should also die too our sins but how do of course we do romans chapter 6 and verse 10 for that which he died he died once for the sin nature moreover that which he lives he lives unto god carrying the death of christ around in our bodies is talking about living 
as dead ones to the sin nature. Our sin nature should not rule us. But we are also alive unto God because he's saying carrying around the, de the, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ so that the life of our Lord Jesus Christ can be manifested. Not living out from the sin nature. That death that he died, he died unto sin once. Verse 11 goes on, Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. Thus also you should reckon yourselves to be dead. On the one hand, to be dead to the sin nature. On the other hand, living once to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ abolished death and brought light. He's the one who did this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. Who has saved us and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That really needs to be a heavy focus of our life. It's no longer about me. You know, the reality is, when this life is over, we're going to step into eternity. You know, now we're talking whether, whether we pass away or whether our Lord comes. The end result is we are going to be spending the rest of our existence in eternity. That should be our focus now. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. So if I've been crucified with him, I'm no longer bound to my sin nature. Sin nature can't rule me but I now can walk in newness of life to come because if I was crucified with him, what else happened to me? I was also raised with him. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life which I live in the flesh. I live out from the faith in the Son of, Jesus, uh, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Death works out in us so that life works out in you. And boy, did Paul face a whole lot of situations with death. But in that death, he brought the gospel. And how many people lived as a result of what he was doing? Of how God was working that out? 2 Corinthians 4, 11 through 12. For always we, the living ones, unto death are being delivered because of Jesus in order that also the life of Jesus should be manifested in our mortal flesh, so that the death in us works, but life in you works. You have life. That living out the gospel. Remember, it's God who causes the light to illuminate in darkness. We do not persuade people to believe the gospel for salvation. We present the gospel for salvation accurately. If you try to persuade people, what's going to happen to the gospel? you're going to drop off the resurrection because people don't want to believe the resurrection. Oh, they're fine believing that I'm good enough that God actually died for my sins. They're okay with that part, but you get to the resurrection. No, they don't really want the resurrection. And you don't believe me. Look at all the gospel tracts we have today that don't mention the resurrection. Or they'll brush over it and then they'll come to how you actually saved and they'll say, well, you have to give God something in order to actually be saved. But that's not by grace through faith. Well, what do I mean by give something? I have to repent of my sins. I have to confess Jesus is Lord of my life. Those are all false gospels. They're gospels that are, that are changed because people are trying to persuade people to believe the truth. But the reality is we don't have to persuade anybody. God's the one who actually brings the light in. He's the one who makes it shine. We just need to present the truth. For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And ourselves, your servants on account of Jesus, because the God, the one who said, out of darkness, light will illuminate. Who illuminated in our hearts, facing light of the knowledge, of the proper opinion of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we hold this in earth and made vessels. 
In these imperfect vessels, we actually hold this incredible salvation that we have. But we have this treasure in earthen made vessels in order that the superabounding of the inherent ability should be from God and not out from us. In all, while being pressed, but not being restrained, while despairing, but not totally despairing, while being persecuted, but not being left behind, while being struck down, but not destroyed, not brought to ruin. Always, while carrying around the death of our Lord Jesus Christ in the body, in order that also the life of Jesus in our body should be manifested. For always we, the living ones, unto death are being delivered because of Jesus, in order that also the life of Jesus should be manifested in our mortal flesh, so that death in us works, but life in you. We have life. God, through, through Paul, brought us the message. And this message uh, that the, the gospel that we have, Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again on the third day, gives us a salvation that allows us access to eternal life and gives us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness to live that out while we're still in these imperfect vessels. And why? Because it shows it isn't from us. Even after salvation, I don't produce good things. That good things are produced in me because I am in Christ. And, and actually, Christ even talks about that. You know, what happens to the branch if it's not in the vine? The branch can't be bragging because it's like, oh, I got these old beautiful fruit. I did this. No, not without being in the vine, you didn't. It's the same thing for us. We don't try to live out through self-effort. We just live out who we are in Christ. And God is the one who actually works that out in us, in these imperfect vessels. That's pretty incredible when you think about it.